All right, here's our quick and dirty introduction to propositional logic for linguists. Just enough propositional logic for you to understand semantics and be able to work with truth conditional semantics and lexical semantics. So propositional logic is all about modeling the truth of declarative sentences or complex sentences formed of declaratives. So when you think, think about what a proposition is, you're thinking about sentences that can be true or false, and these are our declarative sentences. So for example, if you have a sentence like Dave is sleepy, you might not know the facts about the world, but you can say whether or not this is a true or false sentence once you have those facts. Same with the sentence like Julie loves sandwiches. You know the sentence can be true or false, but you might not know what the facts are until you ask Julie. Things that are not propositions are things like questions. If I say, how are you today? You can't just say true or false to that. So that's not a proposition. You also can't have commands as propositions. So like, get me that tire. True, false, that doesn't make any sense. So propositions are things that can be true or false. Now we have a nice little notation for this. We put these little double brackets around propositions to say that this is what's called the truth value. So is this true or false? So we say that the truth value of P equals one means that P is true. So if you ever see one, that means true. And if you say that the truth value of P is zero, that means that P is false. So zero is equal to false. You may see these written in books as uh, T's and F's. Sometimes they're stylized, sometimes they're not, but usually, Everywhere outside of intro textbooks in philosophy, we use ones and zeros. So that's just a convention to get used to. Now we can take simple propositions and we can combine them into more complex propositions, which are called well-formed formulas or WFFs, woofs. So the rest of this will be basically going through all of those different operators and taking a look at how they combine with their truth values. So Negation is our first one. This takes a single proposition and it negates it. So this is when you have a proposition P, you can make a proposition not P. So we have this little bar that means not. So if P is a well-formed formula, then not P is a well-formed formula. Now what you're seeing on the left here is something called a truth table. And what this does is this tracks the truth of things. So it says, what happens if P is true? What happens if P is false? What does not P do to the truth value? So what we see is that if P is a true sentence, like I am happy, then not P, the sentence I am not happy, ends up being false. While if P is a false statement, like I am happy is not true, then if P is false, so I am not happy, we're saying I am not happy is false, then the sentence I am happy, which would be the negation, would be true. So you can think of not as flipping the truth value of a sentence. So that's what the truth table looks like for not P. On the right, what we see is its syntactic structure. So in order to build a sentence like not P, we need to have some proposition P, we need to take the operator, and we join those together to get not P. So that's how we use our structure there. It just takes one proposition. Now, our bottom is our sentence example. So if we say that if Kim is tired is equal to one, if that sentence is true, then Kim is not tired would be false. So here is our English equivalent of it, not tired. And what we can do to get these values here one and zero is we can take a look at the chart. So if Kim is tired is true, so this is gonna be this first line here, then we know that Kim is not tired is going to be false. So that's flipping the truth value. So this is what you need to know for negation. The second one we'll look at is conjunction. So this requires two well-formed formulas, P and Q. So if P is a woof and Q is a woof, then P and Q, so we write this with like an, a triangle without a base, meaning P and Q. That's also a well-formed formula. Now what we see in our truth table is four rows instead of two. We need to take a look at all possible combinations of truth. 
So when is P true, when is P false, when is Q true, when is Q false, and take all those combinations. So the way that the conjunction works with P and Q is it's only going to be true when both P is true and Q is true. In every other case, it'll be false. So if you can imagine I'm hungry and I want a drink, that's only going to be true if I'm hungry and I want a drink. If I'm not hungry, then the combination is not going to be true. And if I don't want a drink, the combination is not going to be true. That's what the truth, value, uh, truth table looks like for the conjunction. In terms of its structure, this requires two things. It requires a proposition P, a proposition Q, and then we take the conjunction to build up to our P and Q. So this is three branching, it's ternary branching. So with our sentence example, if Kim is tired is true and Steve is tired is false, then the sentence Kim and Steve are tired would end up being false. And we can just take a look here. So we see we have a true sentence, we have a false sentence. So this is looking at line two. So when we combine them, our result is going to be false. So that's our conjunction. Our disjunction is about the word or. So this is P or Q. We just use a V symbol for this. So if P is a woof and Q is a woof, then P or Q is a woof. So in terms of our truth tables, P or Q will be true if P is true or if Q is true. As long as one of those two statements is true, their complex woof P or Q will be true. So that means in the first three rows, it's going to be true because we have at least one thing being true in each of those rows. But in the case of the fourth row, neither of those disjuncts are true. So P or Q will end up being false. So the structure is very similar to AND. It takes two propositions, P and Q. It combines them with OR to get P or Q. So with our sentence example, if Kim is tired is true and Steve is tired is false, then Kim or Steve is tired will end up being true. So in this case, we're just taking a look at our second row here. At least one of those things is true. Kim is tired, therefore the disjunction of them will be true as well. Kim or Steve is tired. The last operation we're going to take a look at is the conditional. So this is if P, then Q. So you can think about the arrow as being the word then. So if P is a woof and Q is a woof, we have P arrow Q is a woof, or P or if P then Q is a woof. In terms of the truth table, this one's a little bit more interesting. It's going to be true in every case, except for when we get like this lying behavior. So imagine I say, if you, eat if you eat dinner, you'll get dessert. You eat dinner, what do you expect? You expect to get dessert. So if the, if the condition is true, our consequence should be true as well. But in the case of the second line here, one zero, that's like saying, if you ate your dinner, you get dessert, you ate your dinner, but now I'm saying, no, you don't get dessert. So in this case, it's going to be false but every other case is going to be true. So this is what our truth table looks like. Our structure is similar to the conjunction and disjunction. And in terms of our sentence example, let's say Kim is tired is true, Steve is tired is false, just like before. And then we have the sentence, if Kim is tired, then Steve is tired. So this is like saying that Kim is tired is true, and then Steve is tired is false. So we have one arrow zero, so our result is also going to be false in this case. Now there is a special term that we should learn with conditions, so conditionals. The thing on the left of our arrow is what's called our antecedent. So you can think of this as the condition, and the thing on the right of our arrow is called our consequent. So you can think about this as like the result. The condition and the result are the antecedent and the consequent. If the antecedent is met, then the consequence should follow from that. So that's the conditional. Now you've learned all of the standard operations and propositional logic. Sometimes there are other ones that can be used, but they're all combinations of the ones that you've just seen in some way, and they aren't too difficult to pick up. The last thing we want to talk about are classifying well-formed formulas. 
as tautologies or contradictions. So we have these terms called tautologies and contradictions, and a tautology is just anything that's always true. So these are kind of meaningless statements if we were to say them in real life. It is what it is. Okay, that's a true statement. It doesn't really say anything. I'm mad or I'm not mad. That's not a really a useful statement to say. I'm basically saying P or not P. This is a sentence that's always true. Now, contradictions are sentences that are always false. So a sentence like I'm 20 and I'm not 20, that's like saying P and not P. We might use a contradiction, not literally, but uh, metaphorically to say like, I'm 20, but I have the heart of someone who's not 20. Or you might have these contradictions like it's not true, so it's not the case that I'm human if I'm human. So this sentence doesn't really make sense because if you're a human, then you are a human. Uh, but we could think of this metaphorically. Like it's not true that if I'm a moral being, then I'm just a moral being. Maybe I'm like, I don't know, immoral or something. So this could be like a human being a physical body and human being like emotionally and, and morally something else. So different senses of the word human. But this is it. This is your quick and dirty introduction to propositional logic for linguists. Uh, this should be enough to understand truth conditional lexical semantics. If you have any questions, you can put them in the comments below. Thanks for subscribing, commenting, sharing, liking, all that fun stuff. And to see you in the next one.